So my name is Taylor Kingman. Uh, I'm running for school board, single member district three. Uh, I've, I've been on the school board for the last four years. I have a second grader, a uh, first grader, and a soon to be kindergartner next year. Um, my wife Cody and I moved to San Angelo seven years ago. I work at Shannon Hospital and have been um, really proud of the time and enjoyed my time the last four years on the San Angelo Independent School Board. We done a lot of things over the last four years, some of them popular, some of them not so popular, um, but all of them with the mindset of doing what is best for children in St. Angelo. Um, there's not a member of the school board right now that number one goal is not to provide the best public education system we can for every child in St. Angelo. Uh, you know, some things that I'm proud of that we've done over the last four years. We were the largest district in the state to open on time. We were also um, have kept our transmission rate at, at less than 1% and not had significant closure to many of our campuses due to the safety protocols we've had in place. Um, we've increase the district's rating from a C to a B over the last uh, year. Unfortunately, we don't have any data from last year uh, because there was no star testing last year. But on the board, we've also implemented um, testing that we are now doing at least three times a year on all of our elementary students to make sure that we're not getting surprised at star testing that all of a sudden our kids can't read. If you look at our internal data from the last year, our kids in third, fourth, and fifth grade um, are on the national average for their reading and math, which is, if, if you know where we were as far as averages a couple years ago in San Angelo that's a really good deal. Um, and that's because of a lot of money that's been spent on comprehensive reading initiatives over the last uh, three and a half, four years. Uh, I will be honest, our data also shows that our first and second graders are going to be hit the hardest from COVID. One, because our teachers are trying to teach them how to read with masks on and with plexiglass. And when you're learning how to read that way, that's difficult. And two, um, if we don't have all have seizures. Um, <laughs> perfect. Uh, thank you. Um, and two, uh, they're hit the hardest from last year's closure uh, with the fact that we they didn't have those last nine weeks of school a year ago they're going to be the furthest behind and that's a goal that we have and we have measures in place to um, teach those kids how to read because before third grade that's when you're teaching kids how to read and we have to get we have to figure out how to um, get those kids caught up and not just um, use the excuse when we had COVID. We need to get those kids caught up. And right now the current board, uh, and I'll put a plug in for Bill Dindle and Amy Mizell who also, who aren't here tonight. That, our board is single in mind in the fact that that is our goal and that is what we want to do. And for our older kids, um, you know, we've been working on our CTE program, so our career in technology. Um, we've added at Lakeview, which is not my district, but we've added an engineering program at Lincoln and Lakeview to where kids are going to be able to get college credit for engineering in high school, which is something that we're trying, one, to promote at Lakeview um, to keep kids engaged there, but also because um, it's the right thing to do for our kids. Right now, you can get college credit. It's a lot cheaper to get college credit in high school than it is in college. Um, and we're also doing CTE programs, your traditional, you know, woodworking and, you know, mechanics and everything. But we're also doing uh, things that are graphic design and uh, business and accounting. And we're doing it with uh, angles towards sports marketing and things that get the kids involved. Because whether it's your CTE program or it's your extracurricular, if you want kids to be successful in high school, 
you got to find something other than history class to bring them there. Because there aren't that many kids who want to come to high school to learn about history class. They may come um, for the social interaction, or they may come because they like the football team, or they like soccer, or they like the band, or mariachi, or whatever it is. But you have to have something like that that is encouraging them and getting them excited about being at school. Um, my big thing with college kids or high school kids is that if you teach a kid to be great at something, whatever it is, if they learn and they have the experience of greatness in high school, I don't care what it is, they like that feeling. They want to have that again. And they will. that will encourage them to be better citizens and better community members in the future, which is good for everybody. Um, so I don't even know what I was supposed to say, but that's what I decided to say. Um, <laughs> and, and, do, you, do you have time for this type of questions? I absolutely have the time for questions. What, what schools are in your district? What's great? So first off, I think that I, I, we have schools in our district, but the goal on the board is not to be looking at one school or the other. I mean, you should be, we should be looking at everything. Right. Um, but if you are zoned to Lee, which will now be Lone Star, um, Santa Rita, Austin, Central, um, and I actually have part of Crockett, then you may be in my district for voting. Basically, I have, it's a, it's a kind of gerrymandered sort of district in the middle of town that includes uh, Santa Rita, there's a neighborhood behind Shannon South now that's me, a little, there's a little bit in Bentwood, um, I go all the way a couple blocks north of uh, Austin to Brentwood Park, um, and it's yeah, it's kind of a, it's a it's a, it's a district. Because I was right between Lone Star and Gilbert. You'll be close. <laughs> it's, 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 so you may not actually be in my district. Uh, it depends, yeah. So, but. What I would tell you, the most important thing is everyone just needs to get out and vote. Um, I will tell you that I don't, we joke about, we don't know why anyone wants to be on a school board this year. I mean, we've been dealing with the <laughs> pandemic and name changes and all sorts of things, but um, it's brought out several candidates. And what I will tell you is I think the experience on the board right now, while you do have to have, um, changing of ideas, obviously, and, but the people who are being run against are some of the youngest people on the board with kids in the district, um, and they're being run against people who don't have kids in the district and aren't necessary. you know, they're, anyway, okay. people who don't have kids in the district. So whether it's Amy Mizell Flint um, or myself, we both have kids in the district. Uh, Bill Dindle, if you live on the north side, there's not a better man in the world than Bill Dindle. And he can't be here, and I think he may have a video for y'all too, or did he, or he no, was gonna try? But, uh, I talked with him and I had some good Okay, I mean, I will tell you that all th three incumbents, we've all been endorsed by the Central Realtors Association, and we work really well together, and we're really trying to do what's best for kids. And so, um, and we've also lowered taxes every year. So, I mean, like, <laughs> but we're doing, trying to do what's best for kids. So, Other questions? Yeah, so if you could uh, change three things. So, what, what, yeah, what would you change and where would you get the resources? Um, well, the resource, the one good thing about, uh, or not one, so we're House Bill 3, which uh, changed public funding for schools last year, was a win for San Angelo. Uh, we got an increase in our budget by almost 15, 20 million dollars. Now a lot of that went to teacher salaries, which is good for our teachers, but it also gave us a little bit of wiggle room to do some programs that, and you know, we were very blessed to have that happen in a year where we spent a lot of money on safety protocols and other things. Um, I think one thing we need to do is we need to continue to make our um, career and technology education, our pathways, whether it's your college pathway, your career pathway, or your military pathways in high school, more enticing for people. We need to keep um, promoting success in each of those pathways. Uh, I think we're gonna have, we're gonna have to do, correct our reading in our K through two, 
Um, we already really have the money in place for that because we've been doing it um, with Scholastic and other, and other um, programs as far as reading, uh, leveled readers and guided reading at our elementary schools, but that's another thing. And then the third thing is parent involvement. Um, we got to figure out how to get people engaged in our district so that they're hearing about the great things that are going on in San Angelo ISD. Now that we have some things we need to fix, and we're, we're not shy, we're not scared to say that we have things we need to fix, but there's some really amazing things going on in SASD. When Cody and I moved, well, Cody's my wife, when we moved to San Angelo, we chose to live in town because we felt San Angelo ISD gave our kids the best opportunity for success later in life. And I stand by that 100%. I think it is the absolute best district for our children. Now, I'm not saying that's for every child, but for my children, it is the best district in the world. I hope I want it to be for every kid. And so, um, okay. but uh, thank you everyone for inviting me out uh, this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, just a little bit about myself. My name is Dietrich Tillis. I'm running for Mayor of San Angelo. Uh, I've been out here uh, myself and my family since 2019. Uh, currently, I'm the Director of Compliance and Quality Improvement for Las Bronza Clinics. Uh, I also chair the uh, Risk Management Committee, and I'm also the Safety Officer for the clinic as well. So uh, I have a little bit of background uh, in terms of what I bring to the seat and what I feel like I can bring to the city. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm an undergraduate in uh, Criminal Justice, a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice. I was a Juvenile Probation Officer for a while out in Montgomery County. I uh, have a pretty good uh, working knowledge of, of the legal system uh, there and, and for our young people. Uh, additionally, from there, I uh, pivoted into healthcare and I became a uh, long term care administration, is kind of where I, I cut my teeth uh, over the last 18 years in terms of working in long term care uh, facilities, nursing homes, and also uh, I was also a director of operations for guest relations at a hospital as well out in the Houston market. Uh, where I, also, I decided to go back to school and get my executive master's in business administration. Uh, from there, and uh, I worked in, in those industries for, like I said, for the last 18 years. Uh, I was able, able to learn the operation side of things, understanding what it takes uh, to uh, manage the budget, to uh, help uh, functions of different departments, and make sure that folks can work together so we can achieve our goals uh, in those markets. Uh, there, I was able to. Uh, progress uh, pretty quickly uh, when I'm getting to the business development side of things, when I decided to pursue my MBA, and I uh, rose to the ranks of regional for a couple of companies out in the Houston market and the Texas Medical Center. So that's a little bit of background about myself uh, in terms of my education and qualification. In terms of when I came to San Angelo, uh, when I got my MBA, I was kind of ready to kind of settle down with the company, uh, set some roots, and, and kind of organically grow uh, with the organization. And that's what brought me to San Angelo after a few uh, interview uh, sessions with the Los Bronson Clinics. It was decided that uh, they would offer myself a position uh, with the clinic along with my, my wife as well. She's a pediatric nurse practitioner uh, at the clinic as well. So uh, we came to San Angelo, we fell in love with West Texas. Uh, we were uh, welcomed uh, by the people of San Angelo, and I just thought it was an amazing opportunity to raise our children in such a great community uh, like we have here. Uh, but oftentimes I get asked the question, what made you run for mayor? I mean, you haven't been here, you didn't grow up out here, what do you really know, you know uh, about the community? Well, I can tell you, I, I was raised in Texas all of my life. Uh, the stars at night have been big and bright every night <laughs> of my life out here in Texas. And uh, from my time growing up in Fort Worth, Texas, and my time uh, uh, living in Houston, uh, and all, being all around the state, I can tell you there's a similar uh, theme that kind of goes along when you see uh, the environment in terms of how we've grown and how our state has evolved over time. Uh, one thing that I, I thought was odd a little bit when I came to San Angelo is that I, I never heard of a water bowl. I didn't know why, why would we need to boil our water. Seems like that would be a given for you know any, any type of uh, uh, citizenship. And, and if you're paying taxes, the water shouldn't be in question. I think it's a, a little. Uh, I, I think you're, you're expecting that everybody can afford to purchase water. Maybe a little, little bit more than what we can uh, anticipate. And with me serving at the uh, Las Vegas Clinic, I understand the underserved communities out there in the Concho Valley. So I don't want to make the assumption that that was just a natural uh, fit for everybody to just go and purchase water. Then, uh, of course, we start, you know, as you drive through the city, there are beautiful parks and beautiful amenities, a lot of business uh, uh, ventures that are out there.
but the roads are kind of rough. Yeah. <laughs> Oftentimes I get that feedback when I talk to people that the infrastructure, there hasn't been investment in the infrastructure in quite some time. Uh, we, we have potholes, we have certain blocks that are completely have to be replaced at this point. I mean, I can just say Bell Street and everybody knows exactly what I mean. Uh, and so that was something that kind of got my attention. Uh, additionally to that, um, of course, we moved from one city to the next. Uh, we sold our home uh, in, in Cypress, Texas, and we decided to start go, go home shopping. And one of the first things you ask the other realtor when you're looking at different areas, where do the schools rank? And I started noticing there was a vast difference between the ranking of the schools out here in San Angelo and the rankings of the schools in Houston. Now, of course, I know the mayor that's not uh, in the mayor's purview, but one of the things that I feel like I can bring to the table is the experience that I've had in working with young people and uh, me raising my daughters uh, myself. I know the exposure that they've had in terms of STEM programs that I feel like can be uh, added benefit to everyone in the uh, San Angelo area here. And lastly, uh, when I did decide to uh, announce my candidacy and I uh, announced I was going to run for mayor, one of the first stops I made was at the Workforce Commission because I wanted to get an idea of what is the unemployment rate out here. And uh, after sitting out with the director, she informed me, she said, well, uh, our unemployment rate is around 6.4%, down from 7.3%. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, you know, that, that's not too bad. But when you look at it on the scale of the, 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 scale of the city, there's 100,000 people uh, living in, in San Angelo. And if you look at 6.7%, that uh, or 6.9% roughly, that's close to about 8,000 unemployed people uh, in, in our community directly. And in a population of 100,000 people for a city this size, on average, that should roughly be around 3.5% to 4%. So there's some work that can be done there. And these are things that I don't think individual citizens can take on themselves. I think it's something that uh, our leadership needs to take on and make sure that we have a good, safe environment for everyone to be able to thrive, to be able to throw our, and enjoy our community, and just to be able to continue to grow it and want to stay here. Uh, oftentimes, I, I've met with uh, you know, uh, different organizations and different groups. One in particular is ASU. I went over and spoke to the leadership over there. I spoke to the leadership at Howard College. And oftentimes, we know that a lot of the students that attend those schools are from this community. But when they graduate, they feel like they have to leave the community in order to pursue careers, to advance themselves, and that's our talent pool that we're losing out on. So I want to make sure that we can create environments where we can uh, provide jobs and job growth, uh, a safe environment for, uh, that you can have fresh water to drink, that you can have safe streets to drive on, and that's where I, I feel like I can make an impact here. So uh, in a nutshell, let me give you just uh, uh, the plat my platform uh, on four points. Basically, I want to uh, basically prioritize the water crisis with comprehensive compliance quality improvement standards because I have a background in that. I know what that should look like. I know what questions should be asked when we do have things that go awry. Uh, secondly, I want to create a safe streets initiative where basically it can uh, address the potholes and the infrastructure concerns that we have out here in the city. Uh, thirdly, I want to uh, improve our after school programs with STEM initiatives, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics have an emphasis in that area to make sure that our kids can grow organically and we can grow a workforce organically that are going into the fields of where the future lies. Lastly, my last point, I want to address the skills gap by connecting our residents with our resources for jobs. Uh, and the conversation that I had with the uh, director of the uh, Workforce Commission, she uh, basically, uh, I said, well, if that's where the unemployment rate is, I mean, do we, do we have resources or are there things that you know, folks can kind of tap into to kind of better the situation? And she assures me, oh, yes, we have a lot of resources that everybody can tap into. Only thing is, you know, it's not very well publicized and it's not very well attended. So, again, there are resources that are out there that we can actually tap into, but we have to have a more collective effort in terms of getting the word out to the people that need those services in order to be able to take advantage of them. We don't want to have resources that folks want to take advantage of, particularly when the medium uh, household income out here is roughly around 43000 a year. So there's some areas for us to grow. I feel like I can help uh, in that endeavor, and that's the reason why I announced my candidacy for mayor. Uh, not only that, um, you know, uh, it's kind of a double-edged sword when you look at the COVID-19 experience. Of course, it was something that we were thrust into. I know, uh, from, uh, particularly from the clinic perspective, uh, we were on the front lines of, of that thing. Our nurses still had to uh, you know, answer the call and serve uh, the community and, and do what we needed to do there. But uh, also, we were able to kind of step back and adjust how we provided service. So we, uh, and, and from a clinic perspective, we started offering telehealth services. 
and we were able to service people in a remote way, but still be able to meet the needs that, that were out there for our patients. So I started to look at the city perspective, and I said, okay, what, 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 what can I kind of gain and what can I kind of grow in terms of how are we addressing issues and concerns over time? So COVID-19 allowed me to kind of go back and look at when they started doing the Zoom meetings for the city council meetings, I started going back over those and reviewing through and just seeing, hearing some of the topics that were coming up. And oftentimes, the floor of the meetings would seem to be, there would be something presented, there would be an open question in terms of if anybody had any questions. From time to time, there may have been a, you know, a little dialogue, but for the most part, it was put up for a vote and we just move forward. <laughs> and then you would come to, well, what about the people? What are the people asking for? What are we doing in terms of the infrastructure? And it was always something in terms of, well, we have it on the list, we know that, but we need to address it, and we will get to it, we just don't have a defined time, but when we will. And I, again, I watched it time after time after time as I went through the meetings. Now they opened up uh, uh, the city council meetings, I've been attending those meetings as well. And you, uh, some of you guys may have heard me even, uh, ask questions at some of the meetings. In terms of when proposals come up, there's very little discussion. Uh, there may be a systematic way to approach it in terms of uh, you know, if there are any objections to things, but I think at the time of the vote may not be the op uh, opportune time to raise an objection. I think there may be a little bit more discussion that's needed on uh, particular topics before you just put it up for a vote because most things seem to pass seven to zero or, you know, or, or something along that line uh, when, when different issues can, uh, come up. So as mayor, I feel like that's the person that kind of navigates that conversation. That mayor has to be the advocate for the people in terms of the initiatives of the city, in terms of the direction that you go, that you can say, hey, have we considered this? Have we taken this into consideration? Do we have this, this in place? And again, not to uh, put down or belittle or, 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 well, I say, I think it's okay to question our city officials in terms of different initiatives that come up, but there has to be more dialogue that takes place beyond just uh, rubber stamping uh, different issues that come across the table. Because when it comes up after the fact, when it's already voted on, it's already something that's gonna be moved on, now, the public gets it, and now there's questions that come up in terms of why are we doing this, or, or what happened with this thing that we voted on, that we approved, and we don't hear anything from it you know, for months and years on the end. Uh, so again, uh, I think it matters who sits in that seat uh, of mayor. I think uh, the direction that the city goes in, uh, it matters what the mayor has to say in terms of, of those uh, particular items. And I think that I can not only uh, push forward what's already been put forth, but I can also take us to a higher level in terms of building up the workforce that we need in terms of meeting the needs of, of our uh, citizenship here in our community and also grow our tax base right here uh, in the city. Uh, just really quick, because uh, I know we want to open things up for a few questions, but uh, I read an article in 2019 that was 7 million unfilled U.S. jobs based on skills gap. Now, uh, I'm just thinking there are 7 million unfilled jobs that, that was in 2019. Here we are in 2021, coming off the, the cusp of, of, of the COVID-19 pandemic where basically the world was shut down. Now, I wonder how many other jobs are out there. Additionally, I wonder, what if we could just pull a thousand of those jobs into this community? How big of an impact would that be on our local community and our local, uh, uh, local business uh, ventures for not only the students that are looking for jobs, but also in the communities that, that, that need the resources that can come as a result of having those jobs? So that's just something that I, I, I encourage you to consider when you think about the leadership. I think we've had a good 40 years of, of evaluating the current mayor and her initiative. She's done an awesome job of, I believe her platform is uh, playing trains and automobiles. And there have been initiatives in that arena. But I think there are certain aspects of, of that platform that may be in question as well, just in terms of what's the cost to the taxpayer. We, we, we see that the resources are necessarily being reinvested in our infrastructure, but the resources are already being paid because we're paying our taxes every year. We're, we're shopping in our city, we're paying our sales tax. There's money that's being generated, but we don't see, well, what I found is that I don't see the initiatives that, the, that seem to concern the people seem to be being addressed, which seems to be water, mm -hmm. streets, infrastructure, uh, things for our kids to be able to do to stay out of trouble, and basically uh, how we're gonna address the unemployment rate. Now, particularly, uh, there was another article that came out that uh, once the uh, uh, mask mandate was lifted by our governor, all of a sudden the unemployment claim shot up. Interesting. So even the numbers that I got just a few months ago when I launched in February of my, uh, my candidacy, 
There's been a tremendous amount of unemployment uh, claims that have now been filed that's even going to uh, raise that number up even higher. So I'm sure we'll be hearing in, in the coming weeks or so in terms of what the current uh, unemployment rate is even locally uh, as a result of the impact of now having the mask mandate lifted. And uh, now we're kind of getting back into the everyday flow of things. But the city has to be prepared and we have to take the city in a direction that can meet the needs of the folks out here so that we don't fall by the wayside.